Hello, I am Professor Sims, and in this video I will discuss differential staining, capsules, and endospores. This is the fifth in the series of 10 lab sessions held as part of my Laboratory for Fundamentals of Microbiology course. If you are a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include uh, learning how to perform differential structural stains, including endospore, capsule, and flagellar stains, uh, becoming proficient at observing stain specimen using the 100x oil immersion lens, learning uh, about bacterial endospores, glycocalyx capsules, and flagellates, and of course, as always, understanding safety and disposal procedures. An endospore is a dormant form of a bacteria that allows it to survive poor environmental conditions. Endospores are resistant to heat and chemicals because of a tough cortex layer with an outer covering made of the protein keratin. Bacteria that are capable of producing endospores, they don't do so universe, uniformly uh, during their growth. So it is a process and it's a cycle of sporulation and germination so be sure to read up on the processes of sporulation and germination in the text, and be aware that you may observe multiple stages of sporulation and germination in the same slide. So for example, uh, you may see stage zero or uh, normal vegetative cell with no endospores, and you might see any combination of stages one through six where the cells appear uh, as an endospore that is surrounded by sporangium from the mother cell. In fact, those are the easiest kind to observe under the microscope. So hopefully you have a bunch of those in your, in your stains. At stage seven, the last stage of sporulation, that's when the endospore is all that is left after the mother cell cytopla cytoplasm has dehydrated and all of the mother cell's chromosome is dis disintegrated. So at that point, and you might see these where that's just the endospore that's left. Those are really kind of tough to see because they're very, very small. Um, so why do we want to identify, why do we want to look at endospores? Endospore staining techniques are important for identifying bacillus and clostridium. These are two genera of endospore producing bacteria that contain uh, clinically significant species. For example, bacillus anthracis, that's the one that causes anthrax, has been of particular interest because of concern that its spores could be used as a bioterrorism agent. Um, Clostridium difficile is a particularly important species. It's the one that's responsible for the hospital acquired infection known as C. diff. And then of course Clostridium tetani is the species that is responsible for causing tetanus. Right, so for experiment one, we're doing the Schaefer-Fulton method. This is the most commonly used endospore staining technique. It uses heat to push the primary stain, the malachite green, into the endospore. It helps to penetrate that big thick cortex layer on the outside of the endospore. So the mordant for this stain is heat and the decolorizer is actually water. Washing with water decolorizes the cell because malachite green is water soluble and the malachite green will only remain if it is trapped inside of that thick cortex layer of the endospore. Safranin will stain the vegetative cells and the sporangio, but it won't, it won't be able to penetrate the endospore. The green endospores appear either within the vegetative cells like here, or they can appear separate from the cells altogether. So there's some, I think there's some down here, yep, where it's just the spore that's left. And notice that some of these endospores are clear that just means that um, the malachite green was not able to fully penetrate the cortex layer. And also these ones down here, um, this is a simple stain with crystal violet. So sometimes you can find endospores with just a simple stain and they would appear as clear. Glycocalyx capsules are a network of polysaccharides and proteins and these are tightly associated with the cell wall or the cell membrane. Um, so that's different from what glycocalyx slime layer, which can be washed away, the capsules cannot. They're part of the cell. Certain bacteria and yeast have the protective, it's a protective outer structure called a capsule, okay? And capsule production increases virulence in some microbes, such as Bacillus anthracis, we've seen him, right? He's an endospore former, uh, and also Cryptococcus neoformanus, 
and your pneumonias. And it, it increases virulence by making them less vulnerable, vulnerable to phagocytosis. Capsules also aid in adhesion. For example, when they're sticking to the lining of your upper respiratory tract, so that also increases its virulence, makes it sticky. And it prevents cells from drying out, which is called desiccation. It prevents desiccation because capsules have a high water volume. And it aids in the exclusion of viruses, which some um, viruses attack bacterial cells. They're called bacteriophages. And it excludes those, which also increases the bacteria's virulence. Capsules are composed of mucoid polysaccharides or polypeptides that repel most stains. The capsule stain technique takes advantage of this characteristic by staining around the cells or around the capsules, I'm sorry. So what you do is you use positive and negative staining techniques. You combine them in order to visualize the capsules that don't stain. So the positive stain colors the body of the cell, and the negative stain colors the background. So that leaves a little halo around your cells that is, leaves this little white halo around your cells. That's the capsule. So in that way, you're able to visualize the capsules. What's really difficult about a capsule stain is you have to try to keep the acidic dye, the negative stain, um, on the slide while you're also trying to stain the cells. So it, it's kind of difficult. It means that the slides have to air dry twice and that takes quite some time. So for that reason we sometimes are not able to finish the capsule stain during class and if that happens, you'll have pre-prepared capsule stain slides that you can view, so uh, you don't have to stress too much about that. Pictured here are some more examples of capsule stains, right? So they can vary in size. These ones are rather large capsules. These ones are quite small in comparison, and these ones are kind of in the middle. So they can vary in size, and they are going to look kind of different based on what your cell morphology is but they all appear as a clear halo or a clear little circle around your cells. Flagella are tail-like cellular structures used for locomotion by some bacteria, uh, also archaea and eukaryotes. Because flagella are so thin, they typically can't be seen under a light microscope without doing a special staining technique. So your flagella staining, it, what it does is it thickens the flagella it dilates the flagella by applying a mordant, which is usually something like tannic acid, uh, but sometimes it's potassium alum. But the mordant coats the flagella, and the specimen is stained with this stuff called pararosaline or uh, basic fuchsin. Why do you want to look at flagella? Well, flagella, again, can increase virulence. But it's also really useful in identification. So flagella-mediated chemotaxis, directed motility, these are the kinds of things that you're thinking about when you're looking for flagella. Other key roles in the virulence and pathogenesis include mechanosensory response, adhesion, biofilm formation, and secretion. So these are all things that flagella aid in. So for experiment three, um, you do need to know how a flagella stain is done. Um, and how it works is you have chemicals and heavy metals that help to dilate the flagella, right? And we already talked about the mordant, the, um, the tannic acid, the potassium alum. So these chemicals are actually too dangerous to use in our lab because we don't have what is known as a laminar flow hood that would protect students while working with the heavy metals and stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to observe these pre-prepared -pre slides, and you will have to go all the way up to 100x in order to see the flagella, and it's still going to be pretty tough because they're still very small. Let's look at some of the types of flagella that you might see. The location and number of flagella this is uh, useful in classifying and identifying bacteria. The four major classifications of flagellates are called monotrichus or monotrichus. Both are correct. Correct. Actually, I kind of like trike because it reminds me of like a trike, like a tricycle, and we're talking about movement. So let's say monotrichus, amphitrichus, lophotrichus, and paratrichus. So monotrichus, they have a single flagellum at one pole. Right, so mono, one. Then you have 
amphitrichus. Uh, to remember amphi, I kind of think of ambidextrous, right? So you, ambidextrous is when you can use both hands. Well, amphitrichus bacteria have one flagella at each pole. And then your lophotrichus, these guys are lopsided. Okay, so they're the odd ones out. They have more than one flagella, but sometimes they have more than one flagella just at one pole, and sometimes they have more than one flagella at both poles, so they're kind of lopsided, both flotrichus. And then peritrichus, they have flagella all around their perimeter, periperimeter. Have a look through the lab five specimen. Um, some of these you have seen before, some of you have not. I need y'all to understand that we are working with live, for the first time we're working with live pneumonia in lab five, Klebsiella pneumoniae. He is gram-negative encapsulated, and um, he is a known cause of urinary tract infections and pneumonia. So you want to be extra careful with him. And, of course, make sure to go through all of your safety guidelines before coming to the lab. For all of your observations and interpretations, just like in lab four, nothing needs to incubate, so you can answer all of these questions during class. And I want to thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for the, for the video description for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments below.